Welcome everybody. Feel free to keep interacting in the chat and sharing where you're joining from, but we'll go ahead and get started now. So welcome to Sealed for Safety, Insights on Home Food Preservation. And I am Katie Weston. I'm the Program Manager for the Partnership for Food Safety Education. While we're in the webinar, please feel free to join the chat. If you have a question, I'd encourage you to put that in the Q&A box instead of the chat so we can make sure we see it and we'll answer those questions at the end of the presentation. There'll be a brief survey that pops up after the webinar. We'd love it if you could take a minute or two to complete that. If you're new to the Partnership for Food Safety Education, we're a network of about 13,000 health and food safety educators, about 40 partner organizations, and we have liaisons with CDC, FDA, and USDA. And our goal is to work together to advance trusted, consistent, and science-based health messaging. And this is very important because every year in the US, about one in six people get sick from foodborne illness. 128,000 are hospitalized and 3,000 die from eating contaminated food. So following simple food safety steps, um, including when you're canning and doing home food preservation can help prevent foodborne illness. So I'd like to introduce you now to Carla Schwann. She is the director of the National Center for Home Food Preservation, and I will turn it over to her. Welcome, Carla. Thank you so much, Katie, for this opportunity. I'm honored because I um, value and respect so much the Partnership for Food Safety Education. It's an honor to be here um, today and share about food preservation. So thank you again for the opportunity and provide some um, space for home food preservation. So let me share my screen. Right, and now I can... Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. So let me see if I change the slide, if that works. Does that work? Yep, we can see it. Perfect. So um, again, it's a pleasure to be here today to share some information on home for preservation. And I was telling Katie earlier, I apologize. I have a cold and yesterday I almost had no voice. So if I make weird noises with my voice or if it fails, that's why. Uh, but I'm really excited to be here today uh, to sell some to share some um, insights on home preservation. So let's go ahead and get started. So given the time that we have uh, together today, I do want to acknowledge that there are various food preservation methods. And while I would love to explore them with you all, um, we don't have infinite time. So uh, we'll focus on canning today. And that's again, due to uh, time constraints. And so those listed here in this screen are just some examples of home food preservation methods that maybe you or family members or friends have uh, already experienced and done in the past. And so again, we're going to focus on canning today. And I guess the first question that I want to ask, uh, I want to bring to this uh, webinar is why do we preserve food? And I mean, there are so many reasons, right? You can probably think of many reasons at the top of your head, but let's start with we want to preserve food uh, to prevent spoilage, right? Food spoilage is super important and we want to extend the shelf life of that food to extend access to that food throughout the year. And we achieve that by preventing uh, food spoilage, right? <clears throat> So food spoilage is really uh, the result of several different things, including microbiological, chemical, and physical changes that can occur in uh, a food product and to an unacceptable level to the consumer. And so um, beyond the, the acceptability or the quality reasons that we have, it can also cause food safety issues if you have pathogens present. And so food, uh, food spoilage can be divided um, in two major categories. And as you can see here on the screen, we have microbial food, uh, microbial spoilage and non-microbial spoilage. And so <clears throat> microbial spoilage, <clears throat> we have under the microbial spoilage, we have molds, we have yeast, we have bacteria. And all of those groups, they have their share uh, when it comes to spoiling food. But additionally, depending on the species that we have present, they might also cause disease. And that's why uh, we care so much um, in regards to food safety. On the other hand, we have non-microbial spoilage. 
And so under normal probiotic spoilage, the name kind of says it all, right? Everything that is a not, not a microbe. And so in this case, we have uh, enzymes, we have moisture loss, we have oxygen, which is related to the oxidative process of um, foods. We have mechanical um, damage, uh, like cuts and bruises. We also have insect contamination that all, can all affect and start the spoilage process of foods. So here are some visual uh, examples of microbial and non-microbial food spoilage. So we have moisture loss in potatoes, for example. We have uh, enzymatic activity in the bananas, as you can see, like the browning. And we have visible mold growing uh, in the strawberries and also in the lime. So when we talk about food preservation and specifically food canning, uh, we do need to be aware of a very important player, which is a bacteria called Clostridium botulinum. And this bacteria can produce a toxin that has serious consequences, including death in extreme cases. And so I would like to start before we even talk about canning, but start reviewing some information on this bacteria. So it is an ubiquitous bacteria that can be found widely in soil and water. Uh, but the good news is that the bacteria and the spores alone do not cause disease. The bad news is that the toxin does. And that's why we are so worried about this uh, bacteria. And so uh, this bacteria does can be, um, you know, it likes very specific environments. And so we are able to control it if you are aware of what the environment is and what are the hurdles we can, you know, employ to avoid it. And so this bacteria is very unique because it is able to produce a sperm and a spore. And so I want to start uh, looking into that and how bacteria, not all of them, but uh, some bacteria are able to exist in the vegetative uh, cell form and the spore form. And so Clostridium botulinum is one that is able to exist in both forms. So the vegetative, so, uh, vegetative uh, cell form is an active bacteria and the spore form is more dormant. And so vegetative forms are usually destroyed at lower temperatures uh, than spores are. And usually the spores are more heat resistant. And so that's uh, your first cue why this is um, could be a problem when you are canning and not following proper guidelines. So you're probably asking yourself, but why would a bacteria spend time and energy to turn into a spore, right? And this really happens when bacteria, they sense the environment and they realize that the environment is changing. Maybe there is not a lot of availability or maybe um, access to nutrients. Uh, the pH or the amount of acid in the environment is changing drastically. And so this is a form of protection the bacteria uses to survive longer, right? And so they, if you look at here, you have the, the vegetative cell, it goes into developing the spore. It's sensing something is changing in the environment. It's developing the spore. Next thing you, you, you know, you have an endospore. You have a spore that is very resistant to heat. It can survive for years in soil and water. And so when the conditions are just right, this bacteria can come back to the vegetative cell form and then produce a toxin. However, those uh, conditions that need to be present for this to happen are very specific. And so for the spores to germinate, uh, we need, you know, the absence of oxygen, so no oxygen. Um, there's, you know, not a lot of acid, so the pH uh, is above 4.6. And the temperature is very comfortable for this bacteria. So between 40 and 120 Fahrenheit, so ambient temperature. And so that's when the spores can grow and produce the toxin. And so if you think about canning, those are all conditions that might be present. And so that's why we are worried about this bacteria is the most um, common, I guess, the most um, worrisome pathogen that we have in home canning. So the botulin, botulin toxin is one of the deadliest known, and it has, you know, it causes botulism food poisoning. That's another um, word that you might have heard already. So just to give you an idea, one gram can kill more than one million people. And food that contain the toxin, you know, food can contain the toxin without smelling differently, without tasting or looking differently. So you really, really just by looking at a jar that was canned, you cannot tell if the toxin is present or not. On a more positive note, uh, antitoxin is antitoxin is available, uh, but the recovery is slow, and there might be um, you know permanent permanent nerve damage um, in this you know certain situations. So some symptoms of botulism they usually start within twelve to seventy two hours, and they are observed 
what we, you know, is observed is the weakness of muscles that control eyes, you know, your face, mouth, and throat. And the neck, you know, the weakness might also spread down to neck, arms, torso, and even legs. And so botulism can even weaken this, the muscles involved in breathing. So when you are expanding and contracting the, the breathing movement, it would affect that. And then you have difficulty breathing and most patients usually, you know, if they are to that stage and they die, they die from not being able to breathe anymore. But with, you know, advances in, in medical um, technology and respirators and the antitoxin and all of that, uh, mortality has decreased over the years. So thank goodness, uh, but still a very serious condition. So what is scanning? Uh, so in a nutshell, canning is the process of basically heating food in a jar or in a can, of course, at home, just a jar. Uh, to produce a shelf-stable product by combining both heat and vacuum seal. Those are the two major components that are happening when we are canning. And so in order for the jars to be safely stored at room temperature, um, home canned goods, uh, they must go through an adequate heat processing step that will kill microorganisms or the spores, in this case that we just reviewed, um, that will cause spoilage or foodborne illness. And so that further, you know, that heat, in addition to providing safety to the product, it also destroys enzymes that will spoil, you know, the product as well. Not as much as a safety issue, but a quality issue. So it takes care of safety and quality as well. So it also removes the oxygen that is inside the jar uh, and, you know, forming a vacuum seal in the jar when the jar is cooling. So during the cooling process. And then during the storage, the vacuum seal is what keeps the food and the liquid inside the jar and the air and the microbes outside of the jar. It also prevents the recontamination of that food and the food from drying out if you had that exposed to air. So that vacuum sealing, you know, is really important as well. So for canning methods, what we have available as of now that we know are research-based um, canning methods, we basically have three. So boiling water process, atmospheric steam process or steam canning, and then the pressure process or pressure canning. So those are the three research-based methods that we have available that we can use at home uh, as of now. So which one should I use? There are three methods. Which one should I use? And that's a very common question I get. And so choosing the correct method, um, canning method, is very crucial to ensuring the proper processing and the you know consequently the safety of that product that you are trying to can at home. And so. For the purpose of canning, we typically divide foods into two categories. So we have acid and low acid foods, as you can see here, acid and low acid foods. Here we have a pH scale that um, you see the acidic, acidic, you know, more acidic conditions are towards the left side and neutral is towards the middle. And then you have alkaline or basic towards the, the right side. And so this scale basically tells you how much acid there is. And so if you think about stomach acid, it's probably around one to two. If you think about water, around, you know, six, seven, and something around alkaline um, bleach is a good example that is about 12, 13. And so now to go back to this division, but considering food in mind, we can now divide this um, into acid and low acid foods. And so acid foods are any foods that are towards this side of the scale. So anything equal or less than 4.6 that has that acid is considered an acid food. Anything greater than 4.6 is considered a low acid food. And so this division is really important because this is one of the factors uh, that we use um, when we do research with, um, you know, food items or food products to can at home. And so now that we know this category, this division, we can kind of look into what food items or food products would fit into each side of the scale. So for acid foods, um, there are, you know, the, the foods that we have in this category, they have enough natural acid or maybe added acid to prevent the bacteria and particularly to prevent the growth of Clostridium botulina. And so, um, you know, you can think about foods that naturally have that much acid. So fruits um, that have a pH equal or below 4.6. 
So, um, you know, fruits represented here, uh, salsas are a good example as well, even though they're a mix of low acid and acid foods, but they contain added acid. So that pH is brought down to below 4.6. So other examples would include um, spreads like jams, jellies, uh, other preserves, uh, things that have been uh, acidified like pickles or natural fermentation like sauerkraut or kimchi that that pH is brought again below 4.6 those would be considered acid or acidified foods. And so due to the low pH of those foods or the acid that has been added, this category of food, you can process uh, them using a boiling water canner or a steam process, a steam canning process or canner. And so, of course, with the steam canning process, there are specific conditions you need to pay attention to. But just for you to keep in mind, for this side of the scale, for those type of foods, you can use either a boiling canning, um, a boiling water process or a steam process, steam canning process. On the other hand, we have low acid foods that, you know, would include fruit exceptions like uh, Asian pears. They don't have enough acid, figs, melons, bananas. Also, you know, you have the seafood here, poultry, milk, red meats, uh, fresh vegetables. All of those foods are in this side of the scale. They're pH of greater, greater than 4.6. So all of those, they do not have enough natural acid uh, to be processed, you know, using a boiling water canner or a steam canner. And they have to, therefore, they have to be processed using a pressure canning process to ensure safety. And so... In summary, um, we just look at the pH scale. We know that our, you know, magic number there, which is not really magic, comes from science, but that number that cut off is 4.6, that pH 4.6. Now we can divide if the pH is equal or lower than 4.6, we have acid foods, and you can therefore use boiling water process or atmospheric steam process. And I would put an asterisk here because there's specific conditions on how long you can process until you run dry in this case for this canner. On the other hand, we have uh, foods that are greater than 4.6. So your low acid foods, they don't have enough acid. And therefore you are gonna be using uh, pressure process, in this case, pressure canning. So there is a variety of factors that go into determining a process recommendation for home canned foods and processing times depend on those factors. And those factors include the acidity, of the food mixture, uh, the preparation style of the food being canned, so and also the size of the pieces inside that jar, the composition of the food. So if you think about viscosity, the thickness, the density, um, ingredients such, such as starches or fats or bones that are present, those also will affect processing time. Uh, the liquid to solid ratio and how the you know you were how tight you are packing that uh, jar. That's really really important. The initial, temp the initial temperature of the, the food, if you have a raw pack or if you have a hot pack, and also the temperature of processing, if you're using a boiling water canner or if you're using a pressure canner, a pressure process, uh, the size and the shape of the jar, super important as well. And uh, last but not least, the elevation, uh, because we know that as the elevation increases, the atmospheric pressure decreases and the water will boil at lower temperature. So we need to account for that when we are uh, processing our, when we're canning our products. So this slide right here is where, uh, why we cannot just simply come up with a recipe or look at a list of ingredients and say it is safe to can it. There is a lot of research and I cannot emphasize enough how much research there is that goes behind validating and testing a recipe. So I have lost count of how many times I had people reach out with their grandma recipe or a family recipe or a friend's recipe uh, and ask me to come up with a processing time based on the ingredients or based on a photo or they ask me well can I use this it's kind of similar can I use this processing time but for this recipe and just interchangeably use it and you know I wish I had this magical power of just looking at something looking at a recipe or looking at a photo and coming up with a processing time but I'm just a regular scientist that needs to do research in order to provide guidance. So I cannot just do that. And so I just want to briefly share with you a little bit of what goes behind doing research and validating a recipe. And so, for example, ensuring that that process uh, delivers the sufficient lethality or thermal lethality. And I know that's a mouthful. So what does that even mean? 
um, basically a combination of time and temperature, and that you know would take care of the cons the pathogen of most concern. And in this case, the most concern pathogen that we have is Clostridium botulinum spores. So we need to make sure that the time and temperature combination are sufficient to destroy them in our food if they were to be present to avoid any foodborne illness. And so um, to measure uh, what we we what we do when we do research in this in this area, we measure the cold spot. And so the cold spot, we can see here in this picture, um, you know, we use wire thermocouples to insert into the jar to measure the coldest spot into that jar. And that will vary based on several things, but I'm going to show you in a little bit. But we can use um, different, um, you know, length of thermocouples and we can measure that temperature in different intervals. And so you can see here, this one is longer, this one is a little bit shorter. Whatever we're trying to do, we will determine what type of thermocouple, what I guess what length of thermocouple we're using to um, provide to, to do that research. And so here, uh, the cold spot, they can be, you know, it can be different depending on several factors like the product type, the container type, the size, uh, the processing method. Uh, but today I just wanted to show you how the, you know, the heat transfer mechanism. And so here you have, if you have a liquid food, the cold spot is going to be more towards the lower of the jar. If you have a solid food in a jar, then the cold spot is, more, you know, more towards the center of the jar. And so there, I cannot emphasize enough why we cannot just come up with something um, without doing a research. So some common questions, um, I know I'm, I'm talking too much and we are running out of time, but I just wanted to bring some common questions that I, I you know, get. And I'm going to skip to this one because um, I want to uh, share this one, which has probably gotten um, the most questions on frequently asked questions the last year. Um, the drying, canning, you know, potatoes. And so I cannot even tell you how many times we got this question. And so I just want to bring this example, given the, the time constraint, I'm going to focus on this one now. So um, people ask me, is it safe to dry can potatoes? And when I say dry, I just wanted to picture a jar that, you know, has sometimes in inside has chopped potatoes, sometimes whole potatoes inside a jar with no liquid. That's it. Just a jar with potatoes inside the jar. And people want to can that. And so there's so many things wrong with this concept, but I'm going to try to summarize it here um, in this slide. And so to start with, potato is a low acid food, meaning that there is not enough acid to prevent the growth of certain bacteria, mainly Clostridium botulina. And so that's the bacteria we are most worried about. And so when we test and validate recipes, we looked at how heat transfers. And I just showed you liquid foods versus solid foods, how that cold spot is different. And so we know that heat transfers very differently when we have dry heat versus when we have liquid, you know, heat present or like a liquid medium present into that jar. So that's um, the first things like, no. Um, there's also been some people on the internet doing some laboratory testing saying, well, I sent a potato sample to this laboratory and asked them to look for Clostridium botulina and the sample came back negative. There was no Clostridium botulina, so I'm safe. And so I just wanna use this opportunity to really bring an analogy and to stop, you know, this misinformation, you know, spreading that is going on online. And so the analogy that I want to make is by saying that I sent a sample in and I asked, you know, for a clostridium botulinum analysis, it came back negative, therefore I'm safe. This is so not true. And it's the same thing as saying Carla had never had a car accident, therefore nobody in the world will ever have a car accident. That's the same thing. There's other, you know, um, concepts, science concepts behind on how testing one sample is not enough. Anyways, I'm not going to get into that, but, you know, stopping um, misinformation, this is not a good, you know, uh, excuse to continue this practice. And so all of this to say that there is a risk of botulism and dry canning has not been validated. It is not recommended. And so we do have validated recipes for canning cubed potatoes in liquid. Uh, so, you know, here I included a QR code. We also have this uh, recipe on our website at the National Center. And so I'm going to be providing those slides, you know, to Katie and she can share them with you. So you'll be able to access those resources as well if you're interested. 
Uh, and to close today's presentation, I just want to share some great uh, resources and information on what we have. So the National Center for Home Preservation um, is, you know, the go source. If you are interested in learning more, we have validated, you know, free recipes there. Um, the University of Wisconsin, they have a great um, resource on safe substitutions. People frequently ask, can I change this? Can I add this? What are some safe substitutions you can use? This resource is here. And in addition, um, partners that uh, have great food safety information and, you know, the the USDA has the uh, home guide, the, the guide to home canning. And here is the, the QR code for that. Uh, FDA, CDC, and the Partnership for Food Safety Education are also resources that you can find more information on food safety and, and food preservation in general. And with that, thank you so much for your time. I do realize I talked too much. Um, and now I welcome, any, I welcome any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carla. That was fantastic. I know I learned quite a bit. So we do have quite a few questions already. So we'll jump in. I just want to answer the first one I've seen a couple times. Um, we'll send a follow up email after this webinar with the presentation and where you'll be able to find the recording. And I see a QR code wasn't working. So we'll try to get the correct mm -hmm. QR code. Um, sure that works. Thank you for the feedback. And the first question is, is there any information about food that's safe, i.e. prevents bacterial growth when it's at a high pH, like over 11-ish? So depending on what you are trying to do with that food, are you trying to can it? Are you just refrigerating it? Are you freezing it? Uh, depending on what method you're using to preserve that food, it could certainly, you know, maybe if you're just freezing it, it could certainly be safe. But if you are canning it, and if you're canning it with the wrong method, let's say you're trying to can a low acid food using a boiling water uh, process, for example, or steam process, certainly you're not safe. And so a lot of times when you talk about what food preservation method we should use for canning specifically, People uh, think that by using pressure canner, a pressure canner, really the pressure is what's killing the spore or destroying the spore, killing the bacteria. And that's not true. The pressure is helping the temperature to rise to a level that is destroying, destroying the spore. And so when you think about a um, boiling water process or a steam process, we are able to reach about 212 Fahrenheit. Uh, which is the boiling point of water, right? That's the max we're going to go with those processes, and that's it. We know that uh, spores of Clostridium botulina cannot be destroyed at that temperature, so we need higher temperatures. And the only way to achieve the higher temperatures is by employing pressure. And so by using pressure, we are able to raise that temperature to about 140, 150 Fahrenheit. And so in the case of low acid vegetables, pH of 9, 11, whatever is the pH example, um, we don't have the acid to control this bacteria from this spore from germinating and producing the toxin. So we need to use the pressure to destroy it. In the case of acid foods or acidified foods, we have that acid that is present that is inhibiting the bacteria from growing. And therefore we are processing that food at lower temperatures just to take care of spoilage organisms and maybe other food bore pathogens that are present like salmonella e. coli that are going to be dead, you know, destroyed even before we reach, you know, the boiling po point of water. I don't know if that answers the question or need more clarification. Yeah, thank you. If you do need more clarification, you can add another question to the Q&A. Will there be any testing on canning ground poultry? So um, this question has come up a lot. Uh, ground poultry, um, I guess turkey specifically in the past was not as much requested. We do have a recipe uh, for, for um, I believe, maybe, let me so just see. I can share that uh, later with, you know, put a QR code on that. But um as of now, I can tell you, we have very limited funding to do additional recipes, uh, recipe testing. So we are currently developing a platform in our National Center's website to inquire public's interest in recipe development. So it's not live quite yet. We are we are close to being done, but if you could, you know, and 
if you could go to our web, our page and sign up for the news flash once that's released we're going to send out information and then you can go to this recipe interest page and let us know that you are interested in ground poultry or ground turkey whatever that might be um canning that product we are trying to collect data with this um feature that we are implementing in the website so we can demonstrate to uh, potential funders that really we need funding to do research on X, Y, and Z. And this is how many requests we have gotten. And that's why it's so important. So right now we don't have um, any funding to do additional testing on that, but hopefully with, you know, we have some plans in place to get there. Thank you. I know we're a little bit over time, but I'm going to go ahead and give you just a couple more questions before we end. Is anyone doing research on canning over 8,000 feet? We're getting bombarded with requests about that. Um, I believe there is. Um, so I don't know above 8,000 feet. I'm not quite sure Oregon, if they have regions in Oregon that is above 8,000 feet. But I know Colorado had has great resources on um, higher elevations. I don't know how active, you know, research is going in that state, um, but I know Oregon is doing some research. But again, I don't know what is their limit on the elevation side of things. But I would encourage if you know, reach out to me. I have some information I can provide and some links I can provide. Maybe I'll add it to the resource page as well from Colorado State University. They have awesome resources um, on higher elevation. Um, and then you might be able to reach out to them directly to ask that question. Okay. In Georgia, unfortunately, we are about 1,000 feet. So we can't really do that here. Uh, OK, let's pull one last question. Where can I learn more about steam canning? What foods are safe to steam can? That's a great question. Um, so there was research done in 2015 that was published in 2015, University of Wisconsin, in partnership with the National Center um, that tested what type of you know foods you could can you know using a steam canner. And basically, you can use a steam canner for any acid or acidified foods that have a processing time accounting for elevation below 45 minutes. That's like the caveat, because if you run it longer than 45 minutes, you're gonna run that canner dry and you're gonna potentially under process it. So, and the thing is you cannot just open it to add more water. Once you close the dome and you start process and you have steam inside and steam is coming out and you're controlling the temperature, you cannot open that anymore. And so that's the only asterisk I would say. You have to monitor the temperature and process anything that is acid or acidified food that has a processing time below 45 minutes after accounting for the elevation, um, if you have an elevation that you have to account for. And to learn more, University of Wisconsin has some great resources um, on that as well. Thank you so much. So. I think we're we're quite a bit past time. I know there were lots of great questions, so I'm sorry we couldn't get to those, but we will um, share more information with you, including the slides, and we'll make sure all the links are available that were shared before we go. And I just, I was trying to pull up my slides and they are, I cannot find them. So before you go, I just wanna end with, um, we. One upcoming event at the partnership I want to share, the 2025 Consumer Food Safety Education Conference is coming up in March. You can learn more at cfsec.org. I'm putting that in the chat. There is early bird savings right now if you want to register for that. So I just wanted to make everyone aware. And thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much for the opportunity and nice to, to connect with you all. Have a nice day, everyone.